Hello and welcome. This video will be a dissection on the Tau, focusing on their current state within Warhammer 40,000 9th edition. It will be a critique on their rule set, and naturally, it will feature a bit of narrative and lore as it relates to the mechanics and themes being discussed. At its core, this is an analysis of the Tau's rule set. Fans of the channel will know I quite enjoy discussions on mechanics, and it's my hope that this deep dive will be found to be enriching. Of course, these are my opinions, but I will do my best to explain the rationale, so at the very least the points are clear, and at the best they will be objective truths. And yes, as you can tell, it's gonna be a long one. Welcome to a dissection on the state of the Tau Empire. For the unfamiliar, the Tau are the youngest faction and race in the setting, and they are also the newest faction to be introduced to the franchise's lore. They arrived on the scene in late 2001, right around the time of something else. The arrival of the Tau during the point in time when mecha anime was establishing its foothold of popularity in the West proved hard not to connect with this new 40k faction, whether it was intentional or not. And among the haters, the Tau became labeled as a faction for weebs. And while their aesthetic is evocative of mecha anime, that doesn't make that inherently true. Though there were those within the fandom that did fan those flames. Naturally, with any faction, or pretty much anything, there will always be a portion of the audience which dislikes that particular subject, and I feel this channel of mine proves that principle well enough. But over something like the Tao's aesthetics, there isn't much which can be said since so much of aesthetic preferences are subjective. However, there is a common jab thrown at the Tao which I qualify to be false. So while we're here, I figured I would make the case for it in this Tao video. The crux of the criticism levied is that Tau are ill-suited to the grimdark atmosphere of the setting, that their hopeful disposition and cleaner sci-fi aesthetic runs counter to the very core of 40k. In simpler terms, they just aren't grimdark enough. I disagree. I will concede that the grimdark visual aesthetic is quite common across 40k, though it's largely attributed to humanity to varying degrees and it's especially prominent in relation to the Sisters of Battle, the Adeptus Mechanicus, and certain flavors of Space Marines. But it's important to note that the reason why those tropes are so common in the first place is due to the Imperium of Man serving as the focal point of 40k. What the Tau offer is contrast. Within the setting, the Tau's role as the Rising Empire serves as a foil against the stagnant Imperium and the shattered Eldari Empires, and they foil the Tau in return. And while the Tau's clean sci-fi aesthetic and positive outlook does run counter to the galactic norm, their identity as a young idealistic race in this grim dark universe puts them in a precarious position. Firstly, we have the narrative updates which see the Tau constantly encountering the many horrors of the galaxy, wherein GW loves to depict them getting the brunt of it. We got Tau getting stomped by Raven Guard, by Death Guard, by the Necrons, by the Death Watch, by Space Wolves, and my personal favorite, by Melee Guardsmen. But beyond that is that the Tau's rapid age of innovation has seemingly set them up for disaster. Their prevalent use of AI and openness towards Xeno species are echoing the choices humanity made in its past, and is almost too perfectly setting the Tau up for their very own Age of Strife which in this grimdark universe is likely just a matter of time. But putting my desire to quash narrative misconceptions aside, let's return to the topic at hand. On more than one occasion, I have claimed Codex Chaos Space Marines was my contender for the worst Codex of 8th edition, and I lump Tau's book not much better off. Now this may be a surprise to hear, as Tau definitely hit some heights in the tournament circuit, as did Chaos Space Marines, but we need to look past that because there are aspects of the tournament scene which are flawed. Shocker, I know. And while that topic could deserve a video of its own, 
One of the lighter negative ripples it causes is that it creates falsely perceived understandings of the mechanical health of factions within the game. This is due to associating a power level to the factions of those winning lists and then conflating it with the quality of the rule set. In other words, just because an army is excelling using specific options while being played in a specific format within a specific meta doesn't mean that faction's rule set is well authored or in good standing. Like with Codex Chaos Space Marines, the 8th edition Tau Codex is littered with invalidation across all the levels of the mechanics it provides, from war gear options to units to entire sub-factions. Such a level of invalidation is in my eyes already quite the failing. But there is a worse layer to this lemon of a book. It's an echelon of failure it has all to its own when compared to the other codices, an issue I utterly despise. The Tau Codex of 8th edition fundamentally fails to abstract the thematic qualities of the Tau, and it does so in two areas. The faction that is singularly specialized in shooting is outperformed by many other shooting-capable factions, factions which also hold a level of melee competency far above that of the Tau. And the youngest and one of the most dynamic factions within the setting has a toolkit that is extremely static and inflexible. And with that stated, it's time to begin the journey of putting the proof in this pudding. It makes sense to me to start with the failing that is, the Tau as a premier shooting army. Within it, there are two primary issues to discuss, their weapons, and the skill with which they are used. Technically speaking, because all attacks are successful on hit rolls and wound rolls of 6, all weapons have the potential to be deadly. But speaking specifically, I am referring to weapon standards, and that the Tau's weaponry is not where it ought to be. The framing we need to keep in mind is that while the Tau are the youngest faction, their technology is very advanced. Not Necron advanced, but on an individual basis, they largely have better technology than that of the Imperium and to a lesser extent, Craftworld Eldar. But their peaks fall woefully shorter respectively. What this means is that the Tau's average common war gear should be superior to the vast majority of other factions in the game. If we were to plot it out, we would have the ubiquitous last gun and auto guns in the bottom tier as common. Bolt guns, shuriken rifles, and shooters in the medium tier, with Tau pulse rifles sitting above them in the high quality tier, and Necron Goss flares likely above them. And at the time of the publication's release, I would say the rulings for the Tau's weapon profiles were adequate, but have since become lost in the creep. This began in 8th edition when Space Marines received their combat doctrine system, which really kicked up their weapon lethality. This was then further enhanced by their 9th edition codex and the Imperium's weapon standard update, creating the current Melta meta. And then the newer codices like Drukhari and Admech have really pushed the threshold further, brandishing weapon profiles which would make Shadow Sun herself blush. This comparative disparity of the Tau's arsenal, which as discussed should be above the average, is certainly a failing in their rule set. Hello? Yes, that's right, I did. Oh, you think it's unfair to raise this criticism against Codex Tau when the problem arose due to other publications being released, is that right? Well, I believe it's more than fair for us, the consumers of this premium hobby, to raise this point. Games Workshop could easily have accounted for the rules creep when releasing their supplementary publications, such as Psychic Awakening the Greater Good, or within a chapter approved, and they certainly could have issued an FAQ on their community site if they really wanted to. But GW did not and has not. And this is because they want to inflate the perceived value of their future publications. It's pretty predatory, but it's a different topic, and I implore you to go check out my video on that subject if you want to learn more. And that explains why Tau's weaponry, which by all accounts should be superior to the norm, falls below the status quo. Not to mention those weapons are being fired via a low competency standard, which is probably as good a segue as I will be able to come up with for moving on to the failing that is Tau's ineptitude for shooting. This issue is a bit of a mess. There are multiple contributing factors, all of which work in concert, making everything worse. As for where to start, it probably makes the most sense to start with the fundamentals. For the uninitiated, 
BS refers to ballistic skill. For convenience, and for fun, I will refer to this as BS going forward. BS qualifies the probable hit rate with ranged weapons fired by a unit. Though there are exceptions, across an army you'll usually find a common BS value. This characterizes a faction's competency when hitting their targets, and towers set with a common BS of 4+. With the goal of setting our context, let's talk about faction standards and relative differences across some common BS values. Here is a Guardsman of the Imperial Guard. He is your standard human trained to be a soldier, set with a BS of 4+. BS values relate to the rolled result of a D6. This effectively sets our framing, situating BS 4+, as middle or average. Below this is the 5 plus substandard level, where orcs, a faction not specialized for shooting, sit. 3 plus is our elite tier. Here we have Space Marines, Eldar, the bionic enhanced humans of the Mechanicum, and Necrons, factions which are typically considered superior to the standard human skill level. Also within this tier are the pinnacle of standard humans, represented by the Tempestus Scions and Sisters of Battle. And then we have our Hyper Elite tier, where factions like the Harlequins and the Custodes reside. As mentioned previously, Tau's sit within the average 4 plus tier. Part of Tau's identity as a faction is their poor melee competency, which in theory should allow their shooting competency to shine. However, this is hampered by Tau's common BS value, being assigned as the average 4 plus. Now in fairness, the rationale behind this choice isn't unfounded. The Tau as a race have been classified to be less skilled than the superior races of the Eldari, and the other factions within the 3 plus tier. But this leaves the Tau in an awkward position as a shooting specialist army, due to the fact they are operating from a standard deviation lower than other factions which are also melee proficient, or at least more melee capable than the Tau. It creates something similar to ludonarrative dissonance, a shooting specialist army that is subpar when it comes to hitting their targets. So Tau's common BS average of 4 plus isn't ideal, but in isolation it isn't the end of the world. Orcs are an apt example. Although they have a low tier common BS value, their weapons generally have a greater output of shots, which compensates fairly well for that lack. However, the same can be said about the Tau's weaponry, which for the most part is right in line with the weaponry of the factions within the BS 3 plus tier, as it relates to volume of fire. But this is, of course, in the hands of a BS 4 plus standard. This is further marred by a poor complement of supporting mechanics to aid in the goal of hitting their targets. In order to cover a subject of such breadth, first I will go over the commonplace rules and move on to the more bespoke ones afterwards. Compared to the other factions, there is a sore lack of hit rerolls and plus one to hit mechanics. Other factions can find such abilities across characters, stratagems, traits, powers, the list goes on. And as you can see from the list I threw together, it seems that other factions not only have more hit related mechanics, but also seem to be less conditional and more substantive overall. And in the Tau's case, their primary access to these types of mechanics is behind their unique weapon system, the Marker Light. Marker lights are a weapon which apply a counter to their target upon successful hits, and how units firing at a unit gain bonuses depending on how many counters are on their target. The bonuses range from 1 to 5 counters, and provides a reroll hit rolls of 1 for 1 counter, and plus 1 to hit for 5 counters, as well as other perks which can largely be ignored since they do not relate to the point of this discussion. Before going any further, I should state firstly, I do like that this system allows the Tau to rely on their technology to shore up their shooting proficiency. It is thematic in that regard. And I will say that this system does work. That is to say, it doesn't fail in its implementation. I will point out though, that it is awkward. For Tau to gain a level of competency to hit their targets equal to their contemporaries, they need to first hit each target five times with marker lights. Quick reminder here, marker lights provide buffs which are conditional. Where another faction, all you space marines for convenience, would just need to have a unit beside another unit to have the same hit rate. Then factor in that marker lights are heavy weapons, so infantry shooting them will have negative hit modifiers should they move, 
and that Space Marines can still get their own plus one to hit, and this mechanism that should, by all accounts, be empowering begins to lose its luster. And even if Tile had an easy way to get multiple plus one to hit mechanics, 9th edition's core rules will not let modifiers exceed plus or minus one. So try as you might, Tau just can't hit as well. Their BS creates a definitive ceiling on their hit rate, and they have to work much more for a comparable level of competency. So while it doesn't fail to function, the current marker light system feels underwhelming and unsophisticated, which is definitely off the mark for Tau. It's another case of dissonance between the game mechanics and the narrative they are attempting to abstract. This brings us to the last mechanism the Tau possess to bolster their hit rating, their coup de gras, the master of war technique, Kaoyan. Given the nature of dice-based games, having a reroll mechanic is significant, as it can turn the flow of luck in your direction. With the goal of hitting your targets, a reroll hit rolls of one mechanic, such as the rights of battle ability available to Space Marine Captains, is a valuable rule and an ability which provides you full rerolls is that much more powerful. Hence why it is commonly restricted to powerful figures like Chapter Masters, Primarchs, and the like, who can grant such a buff onto a single unit. Master of War, Kaoyan, is a Tau ability which is used once per battle by a Tau commander, and grants all units within 6 inches the ability to reroll all hits. Full rerolls to hit on multiple units. It's an extremely potent ability. There are a few things to keep in mind. Considering Tau's 4 plus common BS value, which thusly limits their hit rate ceiling, and that mechanics used to increase hit rates are quite rare outside of marker lights, which have their own hurdles, Kaoyan comes across as an exercise in overcompensation. At least I can't help but read it that way. Through the use of this single, full tilt, balls to the wall mechanic, you can shore up the performance of this shooting army, which offers worse hit rates and restricted access to improving them. This result is one I imagine the majority of players would find to be unideal, where most players, myself included, would much prefer a paradigm where your performance is more constant. So through untangling the subjects of weaponry, the common BS value of 4+, and implementation of hit-supporting rules, we now have a clearer picture with regards to what is marring Tau's competency as a premier shooting army, and we can move on to the other major failing of their rule set. As mentioned in the introduction, the 8th edition Tau Codex is filled with unit and rule invalidation. And as outlined in the previous section, we can see an ineptitude for shooting which, simply put, feels off the mark. But perhaps the more egregious failing of the rule set is how the mechanics it provides encourages this young, high-tech, dynamic race a playstyle which is very likely the most rigid among the 40k faction roster. I suppose I should clarify what I mean by dynamic. In my rankings videos, I have used the 6-axis radar chart to categorize mechanics, stating that factions which score high in flexibility and mobility will typically have a more dynamic playstyle. This is what I mean. And similar to the topic of Tau's inferior competency for shooting, Tau's rigidness is a result of multiple factors. Let's start small. Marker lights being heavy weapons discourages dynamic or mobile play, as firing them after moving results in a minus one to hit, an obvious impediment. This, however, has been somewhat alleviated with 9th edition, allowing non-infantry to ignore the move-and-shoot heavy weapon penalty, meaning now it's a small layer, which discourages infantry from moving if they want more certainty in hitting with their marker lights. Then we have Master of War. Again, this relates to Kaoyan. I stated earlier that due to the inferior ability to hit their targets, the Tao's Kaoyan serves as a sort of crutch to shore up that lack. But now let's look at the framing. Kaoyan affects units within 6 inches, so you are encouraged to castle up your units in order to squeeze more value from this ability. On top of that, Kaoyan also restricts units from moving in order to claim its benefits. It results in this once-per-game mechanic, which when leaned upon, begins to skew your playstyle into something rather rigid. Further fortifying the rigidity are Savior Protocols. For those unfamiliar, Savior Protocols are an ability possessed by Tau drones that allow them to intercept damage on behalf of battlesuit and infantry units. It's a fairly unique and very thematic ability for the Tau 
and I kinda hate it. Fundamentally, the current iteration of Savior Protocol's mechanic shares a similar issue with invulnerable saves. In that, it reduces the value of anti-armor weapons to such a degree that weapons which are suited for infantry become more preferable. For the sake of clarity, an extreme example. Let's take a Knight Valiant's Thunder Coil Harpoon and stack it up against a Tau Broadside with a nearby Shield Drone. The Harpoon has one shot. Let's assume it hits with an above standard BS of 3+. And let's say it also wounds with its incredible strength of 16 versus the Broadside's toughness of 5. And let's say that Savior Protocols come into effect since it's a 2 plus test. Now we have reached a point in the attack sequence where the Harpoon is no longer dealing damage to the intended target, and its damage value of 10 has been reduced to one mortal wound. And since this is a shield drone, it has a 5 up feel no pain to ignore damage suffered. While it isn't likely, it's still about a 1 in 3 chance meaning it's well within the realm of possibility for this drone to have absorbed the damage and remain unscathed from this weapon designed to obliterate Rhino transports. It's easy to understand why shield drone spam became a thing, and how it served as a pillar for the Tau in tournament scenarios, but ultimately, the mechanical faults of Savior Protocols is a separate issue. How this relates to Tau's static playstyle is that this mechanic relies on the drones not being targetable, as obviously that makes them easier to eliminate and deny Savior Protocols. This results in positioning the units you want to protect in such a way so that they are within the range of Savior Protocols, but obscured from enemy fire, adding further justification to keep your units in their static position. Now I know this seems like a strange point to raise after acknowledging that Tau's lack of melee competency is part of their identity, but stick with me. At this point, we have covered what comprises the major mechanical failings within Codex Tau, and looking past the mechanical invalidation within, the Codex yields a toolkit that was seemingly designed to abuse the rule set and mission structure of 8th edition. This naturally saw Tau transition rather poorly to 9th, and while there are multiple areas you could point to, what I am speaking to specifically is that within 9th edition's mission structure, the fight phase is where you can steal objectives from your opponents. For example, on my turn, rather than shooting, I would prefer to have this unit of Custodian Guard charge and remove these Word Bearers Chaos Space Marines in melee, so that the Custodies can control that objective. Beyond potentially allowing me to score secondaries, it denies my opponent from scoring this objective for the primary on their turn, and they must deal with this group of Custodian Guard in order to deny me from scoring the primary when it comes back around to my turn. Whereas if I removed the Word Bearers with shooting, and left the objective neutral, the Custodian Guard could potentially be ignored for other targets, as they are not an objective priority, which is in itself less beneficial for me, undoubtedly a worse option. This is an extremely dynamic maneuver to alter the flow of the game, one which for Tau is substantially harder to implement. As it stands, Tau can blast enemies off objectives with their firepower, and in fairness there is a method to move after shooting, but it's either a stratagem made available only to a particular Tau subfaction, or a relic which is only for a single battlesuit. And the 6 inches of movement it provides may not be enough when compared to the movement gained from charging and activating in the fight phase. But naturally, Tau's ineptitude for melee combat makes that maneuver a risky proposition. And depending on the circumstance, the nature of dice makes weakening a target just enough so you can survive combat and contest the objective difficult to orchestrate with certainty. What if the dice don't go in your favor, and the target unit's strength is too high to risk going into engagement range? What if the dice go in your favor too well, and the unit is wiped? What if you are able to remove the right number of models the shooting, but your enemy removes them in such a way that the charge now becomes too difficult? What if your enemy has some melee-oriented stratagems to now punish your unit, now that it is within engagement range? The issue here isn't that Tau need to be competent fighters. After all, I wouldn't want to advocate for diluting their thematic identity. The issue is that Tau lack mechanics to enable them to leverage the value the fight phase provides as it relates to the acquisition of objectives. And with that, we have covered and qualified just about all of what I believe to be the significant failings within Codex Tau, issues which fundamentally fail to abstract their quintessential thematic qualities, their singular specialization in shooting, through a cap ceiling on their common BS skill, and a limited capacity to improve their hit reliability. And in providing a young high-technology race a toolkit which encourages a rigid and undynamic playstyle, 
through mechanics which discourage movement, and difficulty in being able to leverage fight phase activations, and the movement it yields through charging, piling in, and consolidating, to aid in the acquisition of objectives. Well, that was quite a journey we've been on thus far. This was my take on the state of Tau. And so, the review and critique portion of this video has reached its end. The subsequent section is, in essence, me having a bit of fun sharing what I would like to see for the Tau, and my approaches towards fixing the aforementioned problems. Following the order established in the critique section, let's start with the goal of improving Tau's shooting competency. As I mentioned in the critique section, the choice to gate the vast majority of Tau's hit roll compensating mechanics behind their technology, in the present case marker lights, is certainly a thematic choice. I also stated that it's not inherently flawed, only that it is cumbersome, and incapable of elevating Tau's shooting to the proficiency standard of other BS3 Plus factions. For lack of a better term, my concern is that with the aim of increasing reliability, the 9th edition Tau Codex will provide an additional system comparable to the Thousand Suns Cabal points. This approach is one I find to be inelegant, as it adds another layer of fat to an already chonky experience. Rather, I prefer an approach which adds mechanical depth through the elements which are already present. Here's what I mean. So, the goal is to improve Tau's capacity to be good at shooting or at least perform equivalent to the BS3 Plus tier. And logically, what is holding Tau back from that standard is their common BS value of 4 plus. But, as a species, Tau biologically operates in the tier of standard humans, and so the present BS standard of 4 plus is thematically appropriate. The solution I propose is a simple one. Allow the Tau to use their technology so they can operate as a BS3 Plus tier army. Utilizing technology to overcome their biological limitations is already on theme for the Tau, and I have coined my solution as Networked Warfare. It works as follows. Introduce the Network Keyword, which would flag units as being part of the network, a mechanic which can offer interplay with other tech-based rules. Drones, vehicles, and battlesuits would have this Network Keyword. The logic here is that since battlesuits and vehicles are man-operated networked units, they would have a BS of 3+, since the biological Tau BS of 4 Plus is working in concert with AIM assistance via artificial intelligence. Drones being only AI would maintain their BS of 5 Plus. Fire Warriors, Breachers, and the like would be BS 4 Plus in line with their biological standard. These units would not innately have the network keyword, as they are our boots on the ground core units. What ties it together is the network link keyword, which drones would possess granting the capacity for infantry core and infantry characters near a drone to improve their BS by one. This networked warfare system enables the Tau's technology to empower them by granting the player the means to function as a quality BS tier army through utilizing their tech, achieving a paradigm where the mechanics and the narrative are in harmony, or at least to a better degree. It furthers the mechanical depth of the existing components through increasing the utility that drones provide and I will concede that does require a shift, but drones are an extremely unique element of the Tau, one which I feel are underutilized. Essentially, my point here is that this hypothetical system creates the opportunity for more interesting gameplay scenarios than just making Tau another BS3 Plus army, or adding an additional layered system which requires you to count up points so you can spend those points on a table so you can proceed with the phase as normal and I believe it would make for not only a more engaging toolset, but one where the Tau offers quite the unique gameplay experience as a faction. Thankfully, my thoughts on the remaining mechanisms do not require as much time to explain. I think under a common BS3 Plus paradigm, marker lights can work just fine, though I would tweak the table so impact is maintained for each counter, and opt for marker light weapons to be their own weapon type, in the same vein as Orc's Daka weapons, as it should make them easier to rule and integrate with the other army subsystems. As stated, I dislike the mechanisms of Savior Protocols in conjunction with the Shield Drone's ability to ignore damage. Simply, they should be less egregious and more quantifiable. Putting aside systematic game-wide changes, I believe a simple way to handle this would be for the drone to just suffer a number of mortal wounds equal to the damage of the attack so shield drones can still tank damage, but are far, far less likely to tank damage way above that of their weight class. 
though my desire to push for mechanics does wonder if the play experience would be improved by requiring drones to be positioned in front of the target model they are trying to save. I wonder if that change alone would be sufficient, as it would mean you could no longer hide drones out of sight and still take advantage of your savior protocols. My gut instinct is telling me the more movement-oriented mechanics the better, as those tend to feel more engaging, rewarding, and tactile. But I'm curious to hear what you guys think on this one. My solution for this one isn't that simple. Ultimately, the goal here should be to replace the current paradigm of choosing between shoot more accurately but don't move, or move and don't incur movement hit-related penalties. The reason why I rate the approach poorly is because Master of War is supposed to represent the tactical acumen of the Tao's warrior philosophy. It's a mechanic which is trying to abstract the skills of an expert tactician or a tactical maneuver. My position is as follows. Rather than offering performance stat stacking type perks, tactician type abilities are far better represented by rules which instead offer mechanical utility or exceptions, i.e. flexibility. This is why tactician style rules such as these warlord traits from the Dark Angels and Ultramarines feel so impactful, because they provide specific exceptions that open up options to the player, and because the mechanic is offering a flexibility generating exception, i.e. a powerful utility that the player otherwise wouldn't have, the mechanic is in harmony with what it is trying to abstract. So with the framing presented, I would advocate that it would be more appropriate for the patient hunter aspect of Kaoyan to be represented by an out of phase or maybe out of turn shooting ability. And sure, an out of phase or turn shooting activation would be powerful, but this is a once per game ability, and broadly speaking, tower only able to do work in the shooting phase, so I think it could serve well. And when it comes to Montka, I think where it is is presently a good start, but since Montka is the aggressive killing blow aspect of Tau Warfare, this might be a good place to inject some move shoot move type of functionality. Speaking of which... On this topic, I would like to refer to the line of logic I used when approaching Tau's poor common BS. The problem is that Tau cannot gain the movement advantage harnessed by melee capable armies through fight phase activations. The result I landed upon was that the technology which would best assist in this task would likely be battlesuits. The official rules already have vectored thrusters as a relic. Why not make it a mass produced standard support system, and keep the relic one as something a little extra special? And to discourage jumping out from obscuring terrain and shooting, and then jumping back in, Implement a rule which requires the second move to be in the opposite direction of where they started in the movement phase, which should mitigate the abuse such a mechanic could possess. Access to such an ability should, at least theoretically, provide easier access to mechanisms with which to make objective plays. Well, that was quite the journey. If you made it this far, I absolutely appreciate you giving your time to this video, and I hope you found it to be both enjoyable and informative. A ton of work went into it, so thanks for watching. Of course, I must give a special thanks to my patrons, Julius Maximus, as well as the others who help keep the dream alive. So what are your thoughts on the state of Tau? Do you agree with my assessment? Were there any points I missed? And what would you like to see for the Tau when their inevitable book arrives for 9th edition? Please let me know in the comments below. So, if you enjoyed this video, there's a like button. And if you want to help my channel grow, there is a subscribe button. There is also a bell button and a share button, so press the buttons you want to press. And with that, I hope to see you guys in the next one.